大家好，我是巴特曼。上期节目中，我们看了看莱比锡玩具展上各种精致的火车、汽车、飞机、轮船模型。今天我们来看看这次展览上展出的火柴盒和金小车。其实今年来参加莱比锡玩具展，我主要也是为了来看火柴盒的。结果没想到呢，倒是各种火车模型让我大开眼界，完全是意料之外。现在呢，我们就回归正题。这次的火柴盒展台呢，位于三号厅，也就是火车模型所在的展厅啊，可以说是黄金位置了。展台上一共大约有六千多辆火柴盒小车展出，大部分我都不认识啊，见都没见过。我眼熟的估计也就是这套英国最佳和世界最佳系列了。这套老消防车是一下就抓住了我的眼球啊，闪亮亮的，而且车身上的各种细节呢太全了。就不说后视镜、车灯、门把手之类的了，连水箱上的面板、仪表、控制按钮都有啊。车底盘的传动轴都是独立的零件，还有隐藏的小排气管。再看看车头这锃亮的大灯和保险杠，实在是太漂亮了。这套看起来像是九几年出的警察局套装，看来火柴盒也发售过可以互动的玩具场景。然后底下这个小人是什么鬼？脸上涂装也太吓人了吧！给小朋友玩这个，妥妥的会留下童年阴影啊！最扯的是，这还是一个系列，不只是我们现在手里拿的这个。不过看看这些产品的实物图，嗯，我们也不难猜为什么现在见不到这个系列的新产品了。这里的火柴盒小车数量实在是太多了，而且年代悠久，给大家全面介绍这些小车完全在我的能力范围之外，所以就让这个摊位的主人 Dirk s h l o y e 来替我帮大家讲解一下他的收藏吧。对，没错，这个展台呢不是美泰官方的，而是私人的展台啊。所有这些收藏也都是私人的，让我想到了之前在布拉格给大家介绍过的私人乐高博物馆、啊。而且 Dirk 说，这些只是他所有收藏里边一小部分啊，带到展会上来了，更多的在他家的地库里边，真的是难以想象啊。不过在听他介绍之前呢，我先给大家补充一下有关火柴盒的一些背景知识，有助于大家理解一会儿 Dirk 的介绍啊。火柴盒这个品牌最早是由一家叫 Leslie Product 公司创立的。这家公司呢，于1947年由 Leslie Smith 和 Rodney Smith 创立啊。公司名称的 Leslie 实际上就是这两个人名字中的一部分组成的。虽然都姓 Smith， 但其实这两个人并没有血缘关系。Leslie 这家公司一开始生产了很多别的玩具，但是市场反响呢都不是很强烈。后来发售了火柴盒系列的小比例模型之后呢，才在玩具市场打出了名号。火柴盒这个系列的产生呢，是因为当时 Leslie 的设计师 John O'Dell 的女儿啊，他女儿的学校只允许学生带一个能塞进火柴盒的玩具去学校，所以 John O'Dell 就把之前生产的一个拖拉机玩具给缩小了，缩小到能塞进火柴盒里的程度。后来这个拖拉机就变成了火柴盒历史上的第一个产品。一九八二年，因为经营问题以及英国的低迷经济 ，Leslie 公司破产了。破产之后，火柴盒这个品牌被环球公司收购，重组成立了火柴盒国际有限公司，生产线什么的都搬到了澳门。一九九六年，火柴盒又被现在的美国玩具生产制造厂商美泰收购，直到今天。哎，这就是火柴盒小车的简短小历史了。下面就有请 Dirk 来为大家介绍他的收藏吧。I hope you all enjoy the same great hobby as I do, matchbox collecting. My name is Dirk Schleyer. I'm a matchbox collector for well, 36 years now. When I was 12, I really started. I'm collecting models of Yesteryear and Dicky from Matchbox, but、um, I've got some more Matchbox models and in the bunker. Really be shown by you. <laughs> okay.、Um, Next time when we have time. <laughs> yeah, and、um, have a great time, and probably see you here at Leipzig at one of our shows, or visit me at Solingen. Send me an email if you've got any questions. I will try to help. We're looking at the very first series of models of Yesteryear. Which is the vintage car series within Matchbox? It was always produced for the older collectors. Okay, they're not for kids; they're for adult collectors. You can play with them; they have,、uh -huh. they have play value, but the mostly they're made for the collectors, and they're much more detailed and much more expensive in the old days、okay. than they was、um, with the other cars. They started in 1956. 1956. So three years after the normal series started. Okay. And they started with that very first traction engine. That was number one. Uh huh. And the first boxes were always what what they called a matchbox, a really matchbox. I see. The design comes from Norwich Matches. That's a company that did matchboxes for for England. It's、mm -hmm. same design with a little house instead of the car. And the first boxes they were all with these. Um, black and white paintings.、Mm -hmm. That's the first series, and the very first one had a black number on a blue. Oh, it's really、basis. hard to notice. It's really、yeah. hard to notice. Nobody、okay. can read it, <laughs> so they changed it very quick to 
a number oh, I see in a circle, the circle yeah. which is much better but still you have to know what number four is about that's a C box the third box they did they okay. write what they've got okay. inside with a red number that's the third box still having the black and white thing uh -huh. after that they change it to a colored box colored box is this one the tram a tram y3 tram mm. and it's got oh take the other side let's see we're still talking about n50s mm -hmm. and they've got the writing on the side what's inside the thing but mm -hmm. it's a colored thing without okay. a background uh -huh. the next one is with background i'll show you one of that ones something like that beginning 1960s with background and they still have the sides mm -hmm. and um, after that they had no longer models of yesteryear on top but matchbox on top ah, okay. and the last version of the closed boxes which we call them uh -huh. had also a colorful side i see and after that they started with the opening huh. blister boxes that's mid 60s yeah they keep that one till the end of the 60s and after that they had um, these wood grain boxes they are called wood grain because they've got a wood style on the side and on the back uh -huh. that was the 70s. 70s and after that they had the straw boxes a straw box is something like this here that's a straw box mm -hmm. and they kept that style for quite some while and then they had red boxes and after that the collectible area started. Matchbox Collectibles was with Tyco and they did that from 1992 to 2006 and from 2006 this series is completely stopped. So okay. models of yesteryear no longer exist at the moment. Perhaps they make a return someday but we don't know. Okay. The very first tractor if it has a, a copper door would be the first version uh, even this tractor have different versions. Yeah, a lot of versions. Oh so my if you God. want to learn about it, there's a book <laughs> called the Yesteryear Book. Mm -hmm. And then it told you the number model, the scale and the versions. And there's drawings about the versions. Uh -huh. So you know what's happening. And from that model you've got 22. So if you visit me at my hometown, I show you my collection. I've got okay. about 20 of them different and they all I look see. the same for a beginner. <laughs> I see, I see. I started in 1982. 1982? Yeah, that's when I was 12 years old with my father. It was before I was born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm quite old now. <laughs> no, it's, no, that's not what I mean. Uh, this is the first batch of the blister packages. Yeah, it's the beginning of the blister package. It's like the Porsche here. Uh -huh. We're talking like mid mid six mid and sixties. And before they moved away from England, they did the Super GT series, which mm -hmm. was a cheaper series of Matchbox, no interiors, mm -hmm. but to keep the price down and go to Woolworths and change like that to compete against Far East production, was still made in England. And then they moved to yeah, back Macau, okay. China, whatever. Uh -huh. Back in that time, who is their main competitors uh, the Matchbox? Um, they had competitors in France, Majorette, Majorette in Germ yeah. Germany, Siku. Siku. Uh, um, Hot Wheels just started with production in Malaysia. Hot Wheels just started after they declined the sale to Hot mm -hmm. Wheels. I see. That you... was one point where Matchbox tried to fight back the take over by Mattel okay. using their own Barbies and they did a real model collection only three of them were made with only a, three of them are made three three different versions oh, okay we've got all three here uh -huh. with famous models from the times that's um, Beverly Johnson Cheryl uh -huh. Teeth and here we've got Christy Brinkley that's her picture ah, okay that's how she really looks in that cool. day yeah. but they never um, get to the point to strike back Barbie with them. Of course. My first Matchbox playset. That's your first uh, Matchbox? Ah, uh, no, no, that's... Uh, okay, that's the name. That's how they try to push back uh -huh. to the Fisher Price stuff for, for little children. Uh -huh. So they were trying to strike back, but um, 
they should be, have better concentrated on their core market. <laughs> These are nice, but uh, they didn't bring any profit to the brand. Part of the vintage models we've got, like very first gray wheeled ones from the 50s, 60s, then the black wheeled ones from a little bit later, and then the first super fast, like the traditional time mm -hmm. where they had these very thin, uh, uh, the very thin first super fast wheels. In the later days they get bigger wheels, like because he is bigger wheels. Mm -hmm. on, on the inner side there's a little rim, so the car doesn't run on the big wheel, just on the little rim. Ah, to, to keep the speed, but looks better than the small small wheels. Mm -hmm. The real part of Metro history, the big um, English coloration coach. How they started? They started with what we now call the early Lesney toys. Uh, several big, bigger and smaller toys made before they had the idea to do, do Matchbox. Mm -hmm. And from that one, the small version, it's only about that big. Uh -huh. That one sold over a million times and made them the idea, okay, if we do small toys like this, that might be a market to go for. And that's how Matchbox started. Okay. They always build the cars to fit the same box mm -hmm. than the truck. So the truck is normally a different uh -huh. scale than the car, uh -huh. but they all fit to that matchbox size box. Yeah, so we're talking from 1992 mm -hmm. till 2006. 2006. Then, then the whole series collectible was stopped because uh, Taika RC, owner of Matchbox at those days, was bought by Mattel. Mm -hmm. So they stopped the whole line and stopped the collectibles product which was really a pity because they did very nice models yeah. in the bigger scale and with fantastic details. Or even here, engines of a Chevrolet with transmission gearbox and everything. Mm -hmm. And they were made in China those days. Uh -huh. So there must be still some of them around in China. Perhaps some pre-productions or some different models around that would Never issued officially, but um, yeah. Uh, some, um, what they call it, prototypes? Yeah, there must be a lot of prototypes around in China. Uh, ah, right, Dirk Schleyer. The number 11 uh. shows I'm the 11th ambassador. Okay. So there were 11 people, 7 Americans and 4 from Europe. Uh -huh. And you do a service like a link between the designers and the collectors. and. For your service you were honored with that Matchbox Golden Bus, mm -hmm. 11 Golden Buses around and they stopped the thing in 2016, they now do Instagram and Facebook themselves mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I'm very proud of it, I'm carrying it around, showing it around because there's only one in the world and um, yeah, I see. probably and a five figure item. Mm -hmm. Five figure item, units is euro. Yeah. And, uh, and these things will never be made again. No, they're totally finished and that's it. Mm. And mine is the only one with the disc wheels, or the other ones had the um, tri spoke wheels on them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, quite a unique piece and I'm very proud of it. It's not for sale, it will never be for sale as long <laughs> as I can uh, find something to eat. Thank you, Dirk. I hope you liked his introduction. You will have more information about the horse and the horse. He told me that one of the small horse was a horse 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 horse. 1975年就加入了莱斯尼公司啊，而且认识莱斯尼公司的创始人，建议我也去采访采访他，听他说说几十年前火柴盒的故事。这位小老头也很痛快地答应了，他的名字叫 Paul Carr。下面我们就来听 Paul 说说更多的有关火柴盒的小故事吧。Uh, my name is Paul Carr.、Um, I grew up in East London in Hackney.、Uh, I was born there in 1957.、Uh, most of the people that lived in Hackney. Knew someone that works at the factory, or a member of their family worked at the、uh, for Lesneys. And they had、uh, two or three factories in that area. And、um, I started work there in 1975. But I actually started in North London in the Tottenham Tool Room Drawing Office. And that tool room used to make a lot of the moulds for the die cast and plastic parts. And I started there as an apprentice draftsman drawing moulds. 
then um, around 1977 we moved um, a bit closer to Hackney to a place called Chinkford which is actually now where I live and on that site I gradually uh, was kind of promoted to doing the toy drawings, the assembly drawings and I've got an example uh, just here this is a print of the Jaguar the Matchbox Jaguar drawing that I did at the time and this is the this shows the assembly of the parts and this is at three times the scale of the actual toy okay and then from that drawing um, Matchbox would make uh, a pattern out of wood uh, I've got one here this is a not a Lesney era but this is a more recent and it's made from resin mm -hmm. and it's three times the size of the finished toy and then from this they would develop the moulds okay and then from that stage into the 80s I became what they call a project engineer and for that job I would start at the beginning we would go and visit a real vehicle take a lot of photographs, mm -hmm. take a lot of measurements mm -hmm. and then from that the draftsman would do the toy drawings, the pattern maker would make a pattern and the model maker would make a small handmade prototype that generally got used for catalogue photography but they weren't always very accurate, the, the handmade small mm -hmm. model mm -hmm. because they relied on the drawings and the, the big pattern get the accurate model. Okay. Um, I've got an example here. This is a, a model of a Scammel truck. This is a resin uh, copy model. But this was a Scammel truck that never went into production. They did the drawings and they made prototype models, but they never made the moulds. Okay. And this probably would have been in the Convoy series. Mm -hmm. But it's a shame because it's quite a nice yeah. truck. Then why it's decided not to put them into mass production? I'm not sure really. Uh, most of the Convoy or the early Convoy models were mainly American trucks. And I think that's just the theme they were looking at. So that's the sort of thing obviously I have in my own collection. <laughs> and sometimes I get duplicates that I okay. sell. Generally, in the 80s and 90s, um, the different markets around the world mm -hmm. for Matchbox would make suggestions. So obviously Germany would, would want the latest Porsche, America would want the latest Corvette, etc. So suggestions came in like that. And also in our department, in the uh, research and development department, we used to read car magazines and this, this is before the internet so we kept up to date with new vehicles that were coming so there was always plenty of ideas uh -huh. and in those days it wasn't a problem getting permission to make the models I mean yeah. these days everything is tied up in legal agreements and royalties but back in the 80s and 90s it was very very easy to get permission to make a model and there was just a very uh, basic uh, letter giving permission to make a model mm -hmm. so it was fairly easy I guess in those days compared okay. to today. Lesnis was founded by Leslie and Rodney Smith but Rodney he eventually left after a short time and then another guy came in, it was Jack O'Dell. So Les Smith was kind of the sales, marketing, finance guy. And Jack O'Dell was the engineer. And through the 50s and 60s, Jack O'Dell was very much hands-on with the design of the models, the design of the machinery, the design of the factory. He was a really, really clever guy. And when I first sort of got to know him a little bit in the 70s, he would often come around the office and look at what you were doing and ask you what you were doing and 
take a, an interest mm -hmm. and he would walk around the tour room. He was all in a nice suit and tie and everything. Okay. So um, it doesn't fit that office that much, right? Yeah, but he used to like visiting the tour room. Uh -huh. And I remember one time he actually took the radiator out of his Rolls Royce and he brought it into the tour room mm -hmm. to repair it himself. Okay. Because he said he took it to the Rolls Royce garage and they wanted some huge price to huh. repair his radiator. I he see. said, I'm not paying that, I can do it myself. <laughs> so he was a millionaire, he didn't need to do that, but okay. he didn't want to be ripped off by a garage when he could do it. He I was see. an engineer and he could mend it himself. Jack um, used to love telling stories and he used to tell me different stories. But he was famous for, because Lesney was such a large company with 6,000 employees, he never remembered anyone's name. <laughs> okay. And it wasn't until later years when I knew Jack, when he started his company called Lido, and I used to go to some of the Lido uh, big conventions. I got to know Jack a bit more, and one day he actually remembered my name. So surprise. that was a great honour okay. for Jack O'Dell to say to me, Hello Paul, <laughs> how are you doing? Yeah. And I was so happy. <laughs> he told me once that he ordered an Aston Martin mm -hmm. in the 60s, a DB5, like the James oh, Bond Oh, James Bond car. Okay. And he wanted it in yellow. Uh, okay. And they said, no, we, they refused to we do that. won't do that. So he said, okay, so he probably got silver, grey, whatever the colour was. And then he got the car, and then he had it re-sprayed. Uh -huh. And then yeah. one day his wife came into the room shouting and swearing, what was you doing in London? Your car was outside all these men's clubs and all these drinking bars, your car's been seen out there. He said, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. Someone else in London also had a yellow Aston Martin, okay. like his. Okay. And this guy was going to all the hot night spots. I see. And his wife heard about this and thought it was Jack. <laughs> but it okay. wasn't Jack. So it sounds like the yellow color is really welcomed by the Aston Martin DB5 yeah, buyers, if right? Yeah, young and rich and trendy, <laughs> living in the 60s, that was the thing to have. Okay. Yeah. So you should tell me those things. Too. Okay. Cool, thank you. <laughs> 好了，以上呢就是我们今天的节目了。特别感谢 Derek 和 Paul， 让我们更多、更深入的了解了火柴盒小车背后的故事。希望喜欢火柴盒的同学呢也喜欢这期节目。下期节目的内容也同样是重量级的。在来这次玩具展之前，我发过一条动态，询问大家有没有什么问题想问火柴盒的现任设计师 Abe l u g o 的。下期节目就是他对其中一些问题的回答了。感兴趣的同学不要错过。喜欢我的节目的话呢，也欢迎你订阅我的视频频道，关注我的新浪微博。我是巴特曼，我们下期节目再见喽。拜拜。